Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the Kaylee and Casey Anthony series. And if you haven't seen part one yet, please go back and watch it first. I will put the link in the description box because one always comes before two. Thank you guys so much for supporting me and watching my videos through 2018. And I cannot wait to see what 2019 brings for us. I'm really excited to like, just anticipate the kind of cases and the kinds of things we're gonna get into this year. I typically don't make New Year's resolutions only because I kind of feel like it gives you an excuse to not stop whatever habit it is or whatever behavior you're doing that can be problematic and you're like, I know it's only July and I really should stop getting into fights with people, but I'm gonna wait till January 1st to do that because that's a new year, new me. But my new year's resolution, if I had one, is pretty much to just put out great content for you guys. I'm having such a good time with having a YouTube channel. Like it's crazy to me still that I have a YouTube channel and people watch it and it's been the best time ever. And I was having a great time with it. I started in April of last year, so I was having a great time with YouTube before anybody even watched my videos just because it's an expression and it's a creative expression. So I, I enjoyed it and I enjoy it even more now that I know other people are enjoying it, if that makes sense. Let's get started. What is that that I do? This video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is one of those apps to me that makes life easier and it's one of the reasons I love technology so much. I'm not one of these people that pushes it back against technology and thinks that it's taking over our lives, like my husband who thinks my Google Home is listening to me, which I'm sure it is, but I don't care. I love Audible. It makes life so easy, and they have a huge selection of audiobooks, over 130,000 titles in the Audible library. You can listen to your books wherever you are with their free app, in the car, at the gym, in the grocery store, at home when you're cooking or doing housework, and especially when I'm researching these cases because I have three kids and I have a lot of housework to do, it makes it a lot easier to multitask for me so I can research and get facts while I'm also still doing other things that need to be done. Today, Audible's offering you a 30-day free trial with a free audiobook if you go to the link www.audibletrial.com slash Stephanie Harlow. You can try it. If you like it, great. If you don't, what's the worst that happened? You got a free book out of it. Okay, let's get right into the video. So when we left off at the last video, Cindy Anthony had just scooped up Casey Anthony from her boyfriend, Tony Lazaro's home. She is now bringing her to task for being missing for the last month and not letting her know where Kaylee, Cindy's granddaughter and Casey's daughter is. So Cindy has Casey in the car and she's basically sitting there and she's probably thinking to herself, okay, enough, I've had enough. I'm gonna show this girl there's some repercussions now. Cindy is demanding to see Kaylee and Casey's just not being cooperative. This is what I think happened in that car and I don't know for sure, I wasn't there, but this is the kind of dynamic I can see happening. So Cindy and Casey are in the car and Cindy's like, I'm gonna call the police and press charges on you for stealing my car. You need to tell me where Kaylee is. And Casey's like, ma'am, do what you gotta do. Cindy, I, I feel like in your 20s as, as a person is too late to start understanding that repercussions happen when you do bad things, but better late than never, I suppose. So Cindy actually drives them to a smaller police station, which ends up being closed. It closed at five that day. So while they're still sitting in the parked car, Cindy Anthony calls 911. Now this would be the first of three 911 calls she would make that evening. And this is July 16th, 2008. Hello. Hi, I'm, I drove to the police department here on Pershing that you guys are closed. I need to bring someone into the police department. Can you tell me where I can, the closest one I can come into? What, what are you trying to accomplish by bringing them to the station? I have a 22-year-old person that has um, grand theft sitting in my auto with me. So the 22-year-old person stole something? Yes. Is this a relative? Yes. Where did they steal it from? Um, my car and also money. Okay, is this your son? Daughter. Okay, so your daughter stole money from your car 
know, my car was stolen. We retrieved it today. We found out where it was at. We retrieved it. I've got that, and I've got affidavit for my banking account. I want to bring her in. I okay. want to press charges. Where? That's actually going to be in the jurisdiction of the sheriff's office, ma'am, not okay. the Orlando Police Department. All righty. Let, let me transfer you over to the communications section for Orange County. Okay. Now So my next thing will be down the trial thing, and we'll have a court order to get her. If that's what you want to play, we'll do it, and you'll never. Well, then you have a court order. No, I'm not giving you another day. I've given you a month. So as you can see in this call, the 911 operator is kind of like, are you serious, lady? This is clearly a domestic issue. Like, we're all confused over here about what you're calling about because you seem to have the perpetrator in the car with you who's taking your car. So what's the problem? And it's never a good idea to use the police to reprimand or start reprimanding your child because that is your job and not the job of the police. And of course at this time, Casey is still sticking with the story that Kaylee is with the nanny, Zenaida, and she's still sticking with the whole Jeff Hopkins thing. Everything she's already lied about, she's sticking to. So earlier after George Anthony picked up Casey's car from the impound lot and brought it home, he had to go to work. So he had actually already left the house and had gone to work, but he did call Casey's brother Lee at this point because Cindy called George to let him know she was having issues with Casey. And George told Lee, can you get over to the house your sister's not telling us where Kaylee is and we think you can help. So at this time, Lee Anthony heads over to the Anthony home and he actually gets there before Casey and Cindy get home. Once the ladies do get home, Cindy continues banging on Casey, trying to get her to tell her something about Kaylee and Lee jumps in on the questioning. So it's like a mini intervention here at this point, which I think is long overdue. At one point during this makeshift intervention, Casey gets upset, goes into a huff, and storms off into her bedroom. Lee Anthony testified that at this point there was quite a bit of malice between his mother and his sister, and two hours had passed since the first 911 call when Cindy Anthony's kind of putting the pieces together that Casey's been lying. You're just putting the pieces together now, Cindy. We've known this for a long time, but she figures out that Casey's been lying and she places another call to 911. 911, what's the address? What's happening? Um, I have someone here that I need to um, be arrested in my home. They're there right now? a possible missing child. I have a three-year-old that's been missing for a month. A three-year-old? Yes. Have you reported that? I'm trying to do that now, ma'am. Okay, what did the person do that you need arrested? My daughter. For what? For stealing an auto and stealing money. I already spoke with someone. They said they would patch me through the Orlando um, Sheriff's Department have a deputy here. I was in the car. I was going to drive her to the police station and no one's open. They said they would bring a deputy to my home when I got home to call them. So she stole your vehicle? Yes. When did she do that? Um, on the 30th. I just got it back from the impound. I'd like to speak to an officer. Can you have someone come out to my house? Okay. Okay, I gotta ask you these questions so I can put them in the, in the call, okay? Okay. And you said you have this vehicle back? Yes. That have the um, statement She's there right now? Yes, I got her. I finally found her after a month. She's been missing for a month. I found her, but we can't find my granddaughter. Okay, we'll have a deputy out to you as soon as one's available, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. At this point, I don't believe Cindy actually thought Kaylee was missing. She probably just said missing child in order to get police attention. I think she just thought Casey was being irresponsible and hadn't kept track of her daughter, didn't know where her daughter was. Cindy and Lee are just trying to get something out of Casey and Casey is just, I imagine, sitting like this, you know, like, and giving them the silent treatment and not really giving them anything. 
and Cindy Anthony gets upset and leaves the room. While Lee and Casey are alone in the room, Casey tells Lee a couple of things. She says that her mother on multiple occasions had called Casey an unfit mother, and she says, well, maybe I am. Casey also said that Cindy Anthony had told her in the past that Kaylee was Casey's biggest mistake, but she was also the best mistake she had ever made. And Lee's sitting over here like, whatever, okay, you got mommy issues. I know you guys fight all the time, I get it, but where's Kaylee, Casey? I can go get her right now. And if you don't want me to leave, I can stay here and send my roommate to go get her. We can have her home tonight and all of this will be over. This is when Casey finally admits to her brother and to anyone that her daughter Kaylee has been missing for over a month and she doesn't know where she is at all. She told Lee the last time she'd seen Kaylee, she dropped her off at Zenaida's apartment before she went to work one evening. And when she went to pick Kaylee back up, nobody was home and nobody ever came home. She told Lee she'd been running her own investigation into the whereabouts of her daughter by going to clubs and bars that she thought Zanny might go to or somebody might know Zanny at. She also told Lee, like she told Amy earlier that day, that she had talked to Kaylee that very day so she knew her daughter was Safe. She said Kaylee had called her from an unlisted number and when Casey answered it, Kaylee was just talking to her about all the stuff that she'd been doing and Casey pretty much interrupted her and said, that's great Kaylee, but can you put an adult on the phone? Because she says she wanted to find out where her daughter was. At this point, the call either becomes disconnected or Kaylee hangs up. When Cindy comes back into the room and Lee tells her what Casey has just told him, Cindy loses her shit and she places her third 911 call. 911, what's your emergency? <laughs> I called a little bit ago, the deputy sheriff saying I found out my granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. Her, her mother finally admitted that she's been missing. Okay, what is, what is here now. Okay, what is the address that you're calling from? We're talking about a three-year-old little girl. My daughter finally admitted that the baby's in the store. I need to find her. Your daughter admitted that your, the baby is where? It just said it took her a month ago that my daughter's been looking for. I told you my daughter was missing for a month. I just found her today, but I can't find my granddaughter. And she just admitted to me that she's been trying to find her herself. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is the three-year-old's name? Kaylee. C-A-Y-L-E-E. -E, Anthony. How long has she been missing for? I have not seen her since the 7th of June. George Kaylee's missing. Kaylee's missing. Kaylee says Danny took her a month ago. She's been missing for a month. Okay, I just can, I need, I, I understand, can you just, can you calm down for me for just a minute and just, I need to know what's going on, okay? I'm going to try and talk. I'm so worried that we can start with the school. Is your, is your daughter there? I'm on the phone with them. Is your daughter there? Yes. Can I speak with her? I called them two hours ago. They haven't gotten here. Can you speak? Finally, a minute of the day. He took her a month ago. Ma'am. Ma'am. A few things to mention about this call. Cindy obviously sounds panicked, right? She sounds absolutely out of her mind. Another thing to mention about this phone call is even after your daughter has been lying to you for a month about where your granddaughter is, so you know you're faced now with the fact that she's been lying to you every single day for a month, you still tell the 911 operator that the nanny took her. There's no doubt in Cindy's mind at this point that Casey could be lying about that too. Additionally, Cindy Anthony says, it smells like there's been a dead body in the car, which is a statement that will haunt her forever. But of course, she wasn't the only person who thought the car smelled as if a dead body had been inside. George Anthony, the guy at the impound lot, even Lee Anthony, when he showed up at the Anthony home that day, walked by Casey's car in the garage and thought it smelled weird. Then the 911 operator obviously wants to talk to Casey because Casey's the parent of Kaylee and actually should be the one reporting her missing. And often in news reports, I have heard it said, 
her mother didn't report her missing for over 30 days. And that's actually false. Her mother never really reported her missing. Her grandmother is the one who called to report her missing. If left up to Casey, I truly believe Kaylee never would have been reported missing. But anyways, there's this snippet between when the 911 operator asked to talk to Casey and Cindy says they want to talk to you and hands the phone to Casey, before Casey gets on the phone, she says something. And I tried to clean up the audio and I tried to slow it down, but I can't really get to exactly what it is she says. But I think it's something like, I have nothing to say to them, or I don't want to talk to them, or why do they want to talk to me? Okay, is there a chair to talk? They want to talk to you. Answer the question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hi. Well, can you, can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. And you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today now from a number that is no longer in service. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment, about a minute. Okay, did you guys call and report a vehicle stolen? Um, yes, my mom did. Okay, so there's been a vehicle stolen too? No, this was my vehicle. So what vehicle was stolen? What vehicle was stolen? Um, it's a 98 Pontiac Sunfire. Okay, I have deputies on the way to you right now for that. But now, you're, now you're three old, okay, your three-year-old daughter is missing. Kaylee Anthony. Yes. White Kaylee female. Anthony. Yes, white female. Three years old, 8, 9, 2005 is her date of birth? Yes. And you last saw her a month ago? 31 days. From 31 days. Who has her? Do you, have, do you have a name? Her name is Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. Who is that? Babysitter? She's, she's been my nanny for about a year and a half, almost two years. Can, why, why are you calling now? Why didn't you call 31 days ago? I've been looking for her and have gone through other resources to try to find her, which is stupid. Okay. But, can, you, can you give me the name of the, the nanny again? Like, spell it out for me? Zenaida. Z-E-N-A-I-D-A. -A. Casey gets on the phone and the 911 operator has the same reaction that I'm pretty sure we all have. Why did you wait 31 days to report her missing? Casey does not sound panicked. She doesn't sound upset. She's not crying like her mother. She sounds calm, collected, almost bored. And I get it. I don't want to hear in the comments, everyone grieves their own way because that's such a cop out. This is truly not the sound of a mother who doesn't know where her child is. This is not the sound of a mother who is facing the unknown of what could be happening to her child. To me, this is the voice of a girl who spent the last month partying, getting tattoos, drinking, hanging out with her friends, living the good life, and is kind of agitated now that this might be coming to an end, at least temporarily for her. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. We all have our own opinions. We all see the world in a different way. But, you know, come for me or don't, I'm not bothered either way, it's my opinion. At this point, George Anthony gets home from work and you can hear Cindy in the background saying to him, Kaylee's missing, the nanny took her. And because of the fact that they've now reported a missing child and a potential smell of a dead body in a vehicle, the police respond to this a lot more quickly than they had responded to the previous two 911 calls. Lee goes over to Tony Lazaro's apartment on July 16th around 2 a.m. to get the rest of Casey's belongings that she left there, her book bag, her laptop, some clothes. It appeared that the computer had been crashed and everything from the 15th and back had been removed or erased. When Lee got back with Casey's things, Cindy dumped her book bag out on the floor of the garage and in it she found a JCPenney's credit card, a Sears card, both of them belonged to Cindy Anthony. She also found about $200 in 20s in Casey's wallet and all the cops were walking around at this point just kind of trying to get their bearings and she says she remembers asking them, are you guys interested in this stuff or do you want to look at it? And they were like, no, we're okay. As this is all going on, Casey's texting her boyfriend, Tony. She texts him about Kaylee being missing and he pretty much says to her, why didn't you tell me you've been with me all month? And she said, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. 
I love you, I need you. She then goes on to say, I'm the worst person in the world. If they don't find her, guess who gets to spend eternity in jail? Ew, just ew, your two-year-old daughter is missing allegedly. And Casey's already assuming or suggesting they might not find her. And while Casey should be worried about Kaylee, Casey's worried about Casey. At around 4 a.m., a seasoned homicide investigator, Yuri Melich, shows up at the Anthony home and he goes over Casey's statement with her, the written statement she gave to the police officers earlier, he goes over it word by word with her. He expresses very clearly at the beginning, hey, if anything you've said in this past statement is a lie, now's the time to rescind it. If anything you said you wanna correct, rethink that and give a different statement, now is the time. And she says, no, everything's the truth. And you're saying that everything contained in these statements are true and accurate? Yes. Also, before I turned on the recorder, I gave you a chance because I wanted to explain what happens if if you make a false report or if there's something about this incident that you're not telling us the truth of. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure I made it perfectly clear that, you know, if you want to go ahead and, and rescind this statement and if you want to tell me a different story about what happened, mm -hmm. if you're, basically, if you're trying to, to fabricate a story to kind of make something look a little bit better, mm -hmm. now is your time to tell me. Are you telling me that this is the story you want to stick with? It's the truth. It's the story you want to stick with. Yes. Okay. Um, Casey stated that on June 9th, once again, we have this off date, which is not the last time that Casey or Cindy or George saw Kaylee. But Casey says that on June 9th, she dropped Kaylee off at apartment 210 in the Sawgrass Apartments, where the nanny's full name is Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. And Casey says she's known her for almost four years. It'll be four years this Christmas. She met Zenaida through a mutual friend, Jeff Hopkins, because Zenaida babysat Jeff's son, Zachary. Casey claims the first time she met Zenaida was when she was actually pregnant with Kaylee. And just in the past year and a half to two years had Zenaida started watching Kaylee because Casey's friend Lauren Gibbs, the one who found out Casey was lying to her about where she was working and said, I'm not watching your kid anymore. Lauren Gibbs had to go back to school and that's why Casey needed a different nanny. And Jeff said, hey, why doesn't Zanny just babysit both Kaylee and my son Zach at my house for us? According to Casey, Zanny started watching Kaylee in April of 2006 and she claims that she would drop Kaylee off at Jeff Hopkins' home where Zanny would watch both Zach and Kaylee. She says this arrangement went on for a couple of months before Zenaida started watching Kaylee at her own residence. Yet when Detective Melich asks her to verify the timeline and says, okay, so when did Zanny actually start watching Kaylee? She has to think about it and then she says late 2006, early 2007. So if Sandy was watching Kaylee at Jeff Hopkins' home for only a couple of months, and this started in April of 2006, there's a big time gap because a couple of months from April would be June, July. August even, but she says that Zanny didn't start watching Kaylee outside of Jeff Hopkins' home until late 2006, early 2007. So Zenaida moves a lot, I guess, and she also changes her cell phone number a lot. The first apartment that Zanny lives in is off of Bumby and Robinson, and she lived there for quite a few months, only moving to the Sawgrass Apartments earlier that year. Casey doesn't know the exact address of this first residence. After living off of Bumby and Robinson for a little while, Zanny moved in with her mother, Gloria, who also lives around town, I guess, but Casey doesn't remember that address either. I'll post a link to the actual interview. You can hear the interview, but you can tell that she is flying by the seat of her pants. She's making it up as she goes along. He'll ask her a question and she has to like modify or kind of just make up a different detail altogether in order to make the timeline fit what she'd already told him. 
So the night of June 9th, which isn't even the night that Kaylee went missing, Casey leaves work at Orlando Studios and she goes to pick up Kaylee from the Sawgrass Apartments in Zenaida. Then she gets there like normal, parks, rings the doorbell, nobody answers. She tries calling Zenaida's phone and finds that it is out of service. So at this time, she claims she didn't think much of it, just thought something happened which had held them up. So she sat down on the steps and waited for a couple hours. Nobody shows up, she starts to panic. So she goes around to local playgrounds and parks and stores that she knows as a night of frequents and often brings Kaylee to, and she doesn't find them there either. She claims at 7 p.m. when she still had not heard from Zenaida, had no idea where her daughter was. She thought she should go to a neutral place. She didn't want to go home because she didn't want to show up at home without her daughter and have her parents ask her, where's Kaylee? Why would you not want that? Why wouldn't you want somebody's help finding your daughter? So she decided to go to her boyfriend's house because she felt safe there. Detective Melich asks her, who did you tell about Kaylee being missing? Did you tell your boyfriend, Tony? And Casey says, no, the only people I ever told about Kaylee being missing were Jeff Hopkins and Juliet Lewis. Juliet Lewis is back in the picture now. But she doesn't know Jeff's current number and she doesn't know Juliet's current number either because they both have moved around a ton and they've switched their numbers often. She's also got this whole thing where she has two phones but she's lost her personal phone which she thinks has all the numbers on it. She's using a work phone that Universal gave her and somehow she still has the SIM card from that personal phone that she lost. Yuri Melich has the same kind of thought as I do where he says, well, how do you have the SIM card from the phone that you lost but not the phone? And then she claims that she took the SIM card out of the phone because it wasn't holding a charge. And she put the SIM card in the new phone and left the old phone on her desk. And she didn't work for a couple of days and when she came back, the phone was missing off her desk. So somebody had stolen it, which she then reported to the Universal Studios security department nine days previous to this interview that she's currently having. You mentioned something uh, before we went on tape about your cell phones. Yes, uh, I have two phones. I just received a new phone through work, through mm -hmm. Universal. Um, the phone won't keep charged, so I use my old phone that I actually had gotten, again, through Universal for work. Okay. You're, you, did you lose a phone? Yes. Was it your personal phone? It was my personal phone, but I also use it for business. Okay. What's your What's the number for the phone that you lost? Um, 407-619-9286. It's did the you same keep number. that same number? Yes, it's you still the same the number. Phone. I just lost the phone. And in that phone, you're saying it was the SIM card, and the SIM card had the contact Actually, information? Actually, the SIM card is in my Nokia phone, but I know there's numbers saved to the cell phone itself. So if we get the actual phone, I know I have one other number for Zenaida and probably a number for Jeff besides work numbers and... But they're not in your SIM card? They're not saved on the SIM card, they're saved on the phone. I've been trying to figure out on that new phone how to save numbers from the phone to the SIM card and switch them back and forth. So that way I have everything all in one piece. Okay, so the phone where you had the number saved was lost? Yes, I filed an incident report. But how did you end up keeping the SIM card? I had taken it out. I know I left the phone on my desk at work after I'd switched the SIM card back to my old phone because this was the phone that actually would keep charge. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to have a working phone instead of having a phone that would only stay charged for about a half hour and then it would die and I can't make any more calls. It's for me not so practical. After you, after you switched the SIM card is when the phone went? I, left it, I know I left it on my desk and I hadn't been at work for at least three or four days. And you said you made the report to Universal? Or? Yes, with security. When nine days ago. Nine days ago? Yes. She has all these facts. She has an answer for everything. But she still doesn't know if she's ever going to have the number for Jeff Hopkins or Juliette Lewis. They've all switched numbers so many times. And Juliette Lewis doesn't work at Universal Studios anymore. She's just recently moved back to New York where she's from. She then tells the police the same story she told Lee, that she'd been doing her own investigation going to places like Fusion Ultra Lounge. She says Fusion Ultra Lounge, hoping somebody knew the whereabouts of my nanny. And if anybody ever believed this, what she said, I just invite you to please listen to the interview that I will link in the description and tell me that anything she's saying is the truth. And at this point, the cops do ask her, why did you wait so long to report your daughter missing? And Casey says, I was afraid something was gonna happen to Kaylee. I was afraid she would be hurt. Not knowing what was gonna happen to Kaylee 
if she went to the police. But you know what? You don't know what's gonna happen to Kaylee either if you don't. And it gets frustrating to listen to the interviews because you know she's lying, but then you can hear the police talking to her and you know that they know she's lying as well, so you're kinda like, yeah, get her. Oh, and by the way, Zenaida has a seasonal Universal Studios ID badge, so she's worked there, and Jeff Hopkins also worked there, and Juliette Lewis also worked there. Everybody works at Universal Studios. Yuri Melich drives Casey home after the interview and he drops her off and as he's about to leave, George Anthony runs out to the car, taking the opportunity when Casey and Cindy are busy and not around and says, listen, I think my daughter knows something about Kaylee more than she's telling us. I think she's hiding something. And Yuri Melich is like, got you, already there. I know you think like you're a police officer, but I'm actually a police officer and I've been knowing your daughter's been lying for hours. So we're on the same page, thanks dude. After Malich left the Anthony home, he spends several hours investigating the leads that Casey has given him. He looks into all the residences that Casey pointed out to him and finds that nobody named Zenaida ever lived at any of these residences. And in fact, the sawgrass apartment that Casey pointed out to him had been vacant for several months. He contacted Universal Studios to verify Casey Anthony's employment only to find that she did not work there. Neither did Jeff Hopkins. Neither did Zenaida. Neither did Juliet Lewis. So by the time Yuri Malich takes Casey to Universal Studios to have her show him her office. He already knows she doesn't work there, but he wants to see how far is this girl willing to take this story? How far is she willing to go? And he's hoping really that they get to the gates of Universal and she crumbles and she's like, okay, uh, let me tell you everything, but not Casey Anthony. You're talking about a girl here who has learned throughout her life, if at first you don't succeed, lie your ass off again. They get to the entrance of Universal Studios and there's security people there and Casey gives her name and credentials and the guy looks her up in the computer and he says, Nobody by this name works here. And she's like, no, 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 that must be a mistake. I do work here, check again. So he looks into the computer again and he's like, no, you don't work here. What's your supervisor's name? She spits out a name, a random name. He looks that name up in the computer as well, looks at her and says, nobody by that name works here. So she's kind of getting agitated and she's like, what is this operation you're running here? I do work here. And so finally, the cops step in and talk to the security guard, ask if his boss can come out. The head of security comes over and the cops are like, listen, if she's with us, do you mind if we walk through the park? We have a missing child here. You know, we gotta figure this out. Cause once again, they wanna see how far is she gonna take it? Cause they were shocked, right? They were shocked when they got to Universal and she was arguing with the security guard about working there insisting to be let in. They did not think she was gonna go that far. So they're still thinking how far is she gonna go? If we let her, if we give her the rope, will she hang herself? So the head of security allows the police to escort Casey through the park along with a couple other security detail from Universal Studios. And they're walking around the park. They're walking around these office buildings and Casey is just wandering around, acting like she knows where she's going. She's even saying hi to people in the hallway. Can you imagine walking behind Casey Anthony in these hallways, knowing she doesn't work there and she's just randomly like talking and saying hi to and waving to people. Hey George, what's going on? How's that hernia? Hey Joy, how's your daughter? Did she win her soccer match? Hey girl, <laughs> had so much fun with you at the party last week. Can you imagine this? I would be dying. I know this isn't funny. I know I shouldn't be laughing. It's sad and horrible, but sometimes you just have to laugh when things like this happen and I would have been, I would have been laughing behind her the whole time. So she's walking and walking and walking. She turns down a hallway, it's a dead end. There's nowhere else she can go. And she kind of stares at the wall for a couple seconds and then turns around and half laughingly says, okay, I don't actually work here. What? <laughs> so at this point, the police are like, this girl's crazy. And they ask Universal Studios if they can borrow a room to interrogate her in. I mean, interview her in. They get a room, they sit her down, and they obviously go a little bit harder in this interview than they did in the first one. Honestly, at this point, if I'm Casey, I'm terrified right now because I've basically been just found to be lying about everything. 
and the police already told me I shouldn't be lying and you kind of should know that you shouldn't lie to the police so I'd be terrified and they go pretty hard at her at first Yuri sits her down and he's like what is your deal how is this helping us find your daughter how is you lying about everything and sending us off in different directions to different leads to a place you don't even work helping us find your daughter isn't this about finding Kaylee she's like yeah I mean I thought I was doing that because you know, Kaylee would spend a lot of time here and I thought I would go back to places that she, you know, would go to. And he's like, how would she get here? Would she take a cab here? You can tell in this interview and in the first one that Casey Anthony has no emotions. She doesn't seem nervous. She doesn't seem upset. She doesn't seem really anything besides indifferent and possibly a little annoyed. She's very emotionless, matter of fact, calm. Remember our, our, how I opened this whole thing in the morning? Yeah. By saying that, you know, we need to get the complete truth and, and the snowball effect and, and, uh, and how it goes? Okay. Uh, we're about halfway down that hill, three quarters down that hill, and it's a pretty big snowball, which means that there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you uh, just for a certainty that everything you've told me so far has been a lie. I, I can tell you that with, with a certainty, and, and let me explain why. Since I left you this morning, mm -hmm. I've gone to every address that you've told me. I've looked up every name, I've talked to every person that you, you, you wanted me to talk to or try to. Mm -hmm. uh, I've reached out, I've talked to your ex-boyfriend, I've talked to Amy, uh, I've talked to Tony. Um, I came over here, I've already talked to all the employees. Mm -hmm. I found out all these names that you're giving me are people that either never worked here or have been fired here for a long time ago. Okay, so where we are right now is in, in a position that doesn't look very good for you. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be your, your escape hatch, so to speak. Okay, this is going to be the point where you stop all the lies and you stop all, all the fibs and you tell us exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just being, you know, being straight with you. Because yeah. obviously I know and you know that everything you've told me is a lie, correct? Not everything that I've told you. Okay. Uh, pretty much everything that you've told me, including where Kaylee is right now. That I still, I don't know where she is. Sure you do. And I, I'm very confident just by having talked to you the short period of time that you know where she is. I don't. You, you, you do. Mm -hmm. We need to end it. It's very simple. We just need to end it. I agree with you. I have no clue where she is. Sure you if do. If I knew in any sense where she was, this wouldn't have happened at all. You, you it know, wouldn't have happened listen, whatsoever. This, this stuff about, about Zanny, the, 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 the caretaker or the, or the nanny taking care of it's them, the truth. it's not the truth because it went to the apartment complex. There's no person that ever lived there by that name. The apartment's been vacant since March. Stop me at the part that I say that's not true, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to go through this and I want you to stop me at the part that isn't the truth, okay? Mm -hmm. You take your daughter and you drop her off on June the 9th, okay, at, at somebody at a babysitter's house, okay? Now this is a babysitter that lives at this apartment, okay? That's been vacant. I dropped her off at that apartment. Okay. At With, those stairs. Oh, you just walked her. You, you dropped I her off. And, walked her to the stairs. That's where I've dropped her off a bunch of other times, besides then, just that day. Okay. And when you dropped her off, you, 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 who took her at that point? Zanny did. She took okay, her. So at that you point. left her. With, you left her in, in Zanny's care mm -hmm. on June the 9th. Okay. So far, that's right. Yes. Okay. You first call the police about this when your mother and father, okay, uh, actually you don't call the police to report your daughter, Nelson. What happens is your parents find their car that's been towed mm -hmm. from Amscott, and your parents ask you where your daughter is, and you tell your daughter, or your parents, that you haven't seen your daughter for over a month, right? That's true, okay? So I haven't told anything. So, so far I haven't said anything's not true, okay? That, that's that's true, true, okay? Sounds, that's true, sounds reasonable to you, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay? When the police do get involved, okay, when, you're, when your parents involve the police in an attempt to locate your child because they're worried, mm -hmm. the first thing you do, okay, is you lie to the detective whose job it is to try to find your daughter and get her back into safe hands, okay? You give him all kinds of bad addresses to look at, right? Okay? So far I'm on track, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay? Then you bring us out to Universal where you say you work in an office to try to help find stuff that will help us find your daughter. I'm, I'm on track so far, okay? Mm -hmm. And we get here, we walk all the way down the hall to where you tell us, you don't really work here. You don't have an office here, okay? Mm -hmm. So far, everything I've said is true, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, that sounds reasonable to you, okay? I I'm telling you this story. I'm saying to you, listen, I dropped my child off five weeks ago at the babysitter's house. She's just disappeared. Now, I didn't call the police and tell them. Matter of fact, I made some attempts to locate her on my own, but I didn't really get the police involved or, uh, you know, uh, do anything like that, okay? And, oh, by the way, 
um, I, I got my mom and dad's car towed, and then when my parents asked me what happened to my daughter, I told them I hadn't seen her in five weeks. So they called the police, okay? Now what I did is I lied to the police when they got there, okay? I told them a whole bunch of crap that isn't true, gave them a bunch of bad addresses to go look at uh, where I know that my daughter's not there. And I did all this to try to help find my daughter. Makes sense to you, right? Mm -hmm. That makes sense to you? It makes sense to you that I'm trying to help the police find my daughter by giving them a bunch of bad addresses? That makes sense to you? That's what I said, yes. No, no, I'm asking you. That makes sense to you. My Is attempt, that part of it? Okay, no. Not my at attempt to help him find my child, okay, what I've done to try to help him find my child is I've given him a whole bunch of addresses to go to that are bad addresses. That's what I did to help him try to find my child. That makes sense to you? I took him to the last place that I've seen my daughter. Besides that, I took them to other places that I've, okay, when you, that when I've you, seen. When people. you brought us here, when you brought... Yuri Melich actually defined her demeanor as stoic and monotone. About an hour and a half of grilling, she's sticking to her story still. She apologizes for lying, but she doesn't really seem sorry. They leave Universal Studios and go to the Orange County Police Department. Now at this point, the officers who were there with her at Universal Studios and a couple other officers, they have a small meeting while she's sitting in the lobby and waiting. And they're like, something's going on with this whole case. Something's going on with this girl. We really shouldn't let her go. And they say that they thought she was a suicide risk, which I don't think that's true. Nothing about Casey Anthony, who's the most selfish person in the world at this point, would suggest to me that she would ever kill herself, I would think she'd be more of a flight risk, but that's what they said. At this time, there's no proof that Casey has anything to do with the disappearance of her daughter, but at the very least, they can say she's guilty of child neglect and of lying to the police. So they arrest her on these charges. On the afternoon of July 16th, 2008, Casey Anthony was arrested and held without bond. During Casey's first day in jail, she calls her parents home. Now, a normal person, a normal person who has a child who's missing would call home to see if they had found the child yet. Is there any news of Kaylee? Not Casey. Casey calls home to get her boyfriend Tony's number. She also yells at Cindy about how Cindy went on television and said that she didn't know what Casey's involvement was in Kaylee's disappearance. Casey? Mom. Hey, sweetie. Oh, well, I just saw your nice little cameo on TV. Which one? What do you mean, which one? Which one? I did four different ones, and I don't know. I haven't seen them all. I've only seen one or two so far. You don't know what my involvement is in stuff? Casey. Mom. What? No. I don't know what your involvement is, sweetheart. You, you're not telling me where she's at. Because I don't f***ing know where she's at. Are you kidding me? Casey, don't waste your call. No. Scream and holler at waste me. my call sitting in, oh, the, the jail? Whose fault, is, are? whose fault is you sitting in the jail? You're blaming me that you're sitting in the jail? Not Blame yourself fault. for telling lies. You mean it's not your fault? What do you mean it's not your fault, sweetheart? If you'd have told them the truth and not lied about everything, they wouldn't... Do me a favor. Just tell me what Tony's number is. I don't want to talk to you right now. Forget it. I don't have his number. Uh and Cindy's just like, honey, I'm sorry that you're upset, but I don't know your involvement. <laughs> and Casey asks Cindy to put Lee on the phone because Lee knows Tony's number. So Lee gets on the phone and they kind of go at it a little bit because she just wants Tony's number from him and he's kind of like asking her other things and arguing with her a little bit and she gets really frustrated. Hey. Hey, can you give me Tony's number? Are you... <laughs> I can do that. I don't know what real good it's going to do at this point. Well, I'd like to talk to him anyway. Okay. Because I called to talk to my mother, and it, it, it's f***ing waste. Oh, by the way, I don't want any of you coming up here when I have my my first hearing for Bond and everything else. Like, don't even f waste your time coming up here. You know, you're having a real tough, you're making it real tough for anybody to want to try to, even if she was giving you See, somebody's phone number. You're not even letting me finish. Well, like, well, I really, Miss God. you're asking me, first you're asking me for Tony's phone number so you can call him, and then you immediately want to start pressing towards me and saying, don't even worry about coming up here for all this stuff and trying to cut us out. I'm what? not trying to cut anybody out. I'm not going around and around with you, you know, this, that's pretty pointless. Uh, I'm not going to go through not going to put everybody else through the same stuff that you've been putting the police and everybody else through for the last 24 hours and the stuff you've been putting mom through for the last four or five weeks. I'm done with that. 
he doesn't give her the number right away and he actually puts a friend of hers on the phone, Christina. Christina's at the Anthony home with um, George and Cindy now and Christina's been an old friend of Casey's for a little while. Wait, wait, so here's Christina, she can sing your No, no, I want Tony's number, I'm not talking to anybody else. Huh? Hi, I'm glad everybody's at my house. I'll have to call you later, I'll have to call somebody to get your number. Do me a favor, get my brother back because I need Tony's number. Okay, um, is there anything I can do for you? I'm sitting in jail, there's nothing anybody can do right now. Oh, I'm just trying to be... Oh, I know you are, honey. I, I absolutely know that you are, and I appreciate everything that you're trying to do, but I'm, I'd like to call Tony. He's not at my house, is he? No, okay. no, it's just me and your parents and Lee. Okay, well, can you do me a favor and get my brother back or get the number from him, please? Um, do, does Tony have anything to do with Taylor? No, nothing. Okay, so why do you want to talk to Tony? I... You, don't want to, you probably don't want to tell me, do you? Huh? You probably don't want to tell me, do you? What do you, well, I didn't hear what you said. I said, does Tony have anything to do with Kaylee? No, Tony has nothing to do with Kaylee. Oh, so I, wh why do you want to talk to him? Because you don't want to tell me. he's my boyfriend and I won't actually try to sit and talk to him because I didn't get a chance to talk to him earlier because I got arrested on whim today because they're blaming me for stuff that I never would do, that I didn't do. Okay. Well, I'm on nobody. I'm on your side. You know that. Oh, honey, I know that. I just want to talk to Tony and get a little bit of. Wait, Casey, uh, you have to tell me if you know anything about Kaylee. Sweetheart, if anything if I, happens with Kaylee, Casey, I'll die. You understand? I'll die. If anything Hello. happens to that baby. Oh my God! Calling you guys, a waste, huge waste. I love how Christina asked Casey, "Does Tony have anything to do with Kaylee?" and Casey says, no, he has nothing to do with Kaylee. And Christina says, why do you want to talk to him then? And she's like, I'm on your side, but you're crazy. Finally, Casey gets Tony's number and that's pretty much all she wanted from these people. So she tries to get off the phone as quickly as possible after she gets the phone number. Now, as the cops are searching for Zanny the nanny, they actually do find a woman living in Orlando named Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. What are the odds? So this woman says she's never met Casey Anthony, never met Kaylee Anthony, didn't meet any of the people that Casey had said she met her through. Pretty much, you know, investigating into her, they realized, the cops, that she had nothing to do with Casey Anthony, that Casey Anthony had pretty much just pulled this name out of thin air or maybe searched for it. She wasn't the same Zanny. So Casey's sitting in jail right now, just worried about talking to Tony. And here's the investigation that's taking place as she sits in jail where she belongs. The police took her white Pontiac into custody on July 17th and they collected a bunch of evidence from it. So they got hair and carpet samples from the trunk, samples from the spare tire, which was also in the trunk. Casey, George, Cindy, and Lee Anthony all gave samples of their DNA as well as DNA taken from a hairbrush that had been used by Kaylee. They also took samples of the air which was found in the trunk, which is weird to me, but they took scrapings from the wheel well and they took samples of the paper towels that were found in the bag of garbage that had been thrown over the gate into the dumpster at the impound lab. The bag of garbage they found in Casey Anthony's trunk with the pizza and the maggots, they had to get that bag out of the dumpster. They had to look at the stuff in the bag. The human hair and other evidence collected from the car was sent to the FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. They also found tiny flies in the trunk of Casey's car and forensic entomologist Neil Haskell determined that these types of flies were attracted to decomposing organic material. The paper towels that were in the bag of pizza and maggots, they were analyzed and they were found to contain traces of what they call grave wax, which is basically a waxy substance that decomposing bodies produce. Human hair was recovered from the trunk and one of these hairs displayed a sort of banding quality at the root. They call it death banding. It appeared to investigators that the trunk had recently been cleaned and vacuumed, but they still were able to recover several hairs. The one that displayed the death banding at the root matched the hair they found in Kaylee Anthony's hairbrush. It was also thought to be untreated, this hair, which means it was never dyed or permed or had any chemicals put on it. And since both Cindy and Casey had had treatments done to their hair before. It was determined that this hair could not belong to them and it had to belong to Kaylee. Now they say this death banding occurs only when a hair is removed from a decomposing body. 
That might not necessarily be true, which we will get into during the trial portion of this video. And a lot of this evidence that came up and was discovered, the defense had counter arguments for it, of course. Forensic testing was done on the Pontiac's trunk along with scrapings from the wheel well, air samples from the trunk, and they were analyzed by Arpad Voss, who's a senior research analyst at Tennessee's Oak Ridge National Laboratory. During this process of analyzing the trunk and its contents, Arpad Voss claims he found seven compounds significant in the process of human decomposition. Voss concluded that there was no other probable reason why these compounds would be present other than a dead body having been in the trunk of that car. According to Arpad Voss, he also found evidence of chloroform on the carpet of the trunk. And he described the amount of chloroform he found in the trunk being an extremely high level. Thursday, July 17th, the Orange County Sheriff's Department also had cadaver dogs do a sweep of Casey's car. The dog's name was Garris, and he actually alerted two human remains being in the vehicle. The next day, they brought Garris to the Anthony home and asked for permission to bring the dogs there, and Cindy and George said okay. And Garris actually alerted in the backyard near Kaylee's playhouse. They wanted to kind of double check their work, so they called and had another cadaver dog brought in. I don't know this dog's name, unfortunately. I didn't find it, but they brought another dog in and they had this dog sweep the backyard as well and the dog alerted in the same areas that Garris had by the playhouse. Police then dug in these areas where the dogs alerted, but they didn't find anything. On July 18th, 2008, Casey Anthony hires attorney Jose Baez to represent her. Let's talk a little bit about Jose Baez. Um, for reference point, for future reference, I should say. When Casey hired him, he was for the most part an unknown lawyer and had not taken part in any high profile cases. At the time of being Casey's attorney, Jose was in his second marriage and had a seven year old son. There was a lot of speculation about how Casey paid Jose for his legal fees, and I will get into that later on, but it ended up looking as if she sold pictures of her daughter to ABC networks for money that she then used to pay her attorney, which is disgusting, let's be honest. Jose Baez grew up in Miami in a poor family. His parents split up when he was only four and his mother had to work several jobs to keep the family afloat. He dropped out of school when he was in the ninth grade and when he was 17, he got a girl he had met at a club pregnant. He married her, enlisted in the Navy, got his GED and began taking classes at a local community college. When he was 23, he and his first wife were divorced and he transferred to Florida State to major in criminal justice. In looking into Jose Baez's background, I can see why he was drawn to Casey Anthony. There are parallels in their life and their experiences. They both had kids young. They both dropped out of school. They both were kind of thrown into lives that maybe they hadn't chosen for themselves. After Florida State, Jose went to St. Thomas University School of Law in Miami, and during his second year there, he accepted an internship at the state attorney's office. He worked there for one day before he realized that being a prosecutor wasn't for him. That same day, he showed up at the Miami-Dade Public Defender's Office. He wanted to do his internship there. His supervisor at the public defender's office said Jose Baez was very aggressive, always ready to fight. Whereas other young defenders were quick to take pleas or want to make deals, Jose wanted to be in the courtroom. He worked on 34 cases as a legal intern and he was still going to law school at this time. And he says he would often cut his classes, leave early so he could get out and watch the OJ Simpson trial. He was completely hypnotized by the charismatic ways of attorneys such as Johnny Cochran and Robert Shapiro. He said he really liked how Johnny Cochran would focus on the jury and make them feel important and that no other attorney really did that. His promising career as a public defender faced roadblocks due to personal and financial troubles. He was faced with $100,000 of unpaid student loans and a looming bankruptcy. His ex-wife notified the Florida State Bar that he owed her $12,000 in back child support. And because of this, he was denied admission to the bar. The Florida Supreme Court backed this decision, saying that Jose Baez showed a total lack of respect for the rights of others and a total lack of respect for the legal system. 
He worked as an investigator for a little bit, and he also worked at LexisNexis, which is basically a legal research database for law students. After five years of being denied the ability to practice law, he reapplied to the bar and was granted admission. Initially, Jose worked out of a small suite of offices in Kissimmee, Florida. He was one of the only Latino lawyers working in the area, and as a result, a lot of his clients were Latino. He built a small but steady business, handling mostly things like domestic disputes, prostitution, drunk driving, robbery, stuff like that. When he took on Casey Anthony's case, he had only been a member of the bar for three years and had only been a part of five murder cases. So for the most part, especially pertaining to murder cases, Jose Baez was young and inexperienced, which would show often throughout the trial of Casey Anthony. On July 22nd, Casey Anthony had her bond hearing. A bond hearing is basically just a hearing in which a judge decides what kind of bond he is gonna set. So the person who's been accused of the crime can get out of jail essentially while they're waiting for their trial. Cindy Anthony takes the stand First, she's crying already as soon as she hits the stand and they're like, are you okay? Do you need some time? She's like, no, it's just the first time that I've seen Kaylee, I mean Casey in a week. Literally, she says Kaylee, I mean Casey. Thank you, please have a seat. Thank you. 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 Thank Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. Can you state your name and relationship to Cynthia? Cynthia M. Marie Anthony. Um, I'm her mother. The judge asks her, when's the last time you saw Kaylee? And she says, I think it was June 8th, or I thought it was June 8th, but I was just corrected yesterday by the police when you know they, they informed me that I actually had seen her on the 15th, which was Father's Day, and I just got all my Sundays mixed up because usually I go and see my father on Sunday, so I just, I got it mixed up. I do have to admit though, I'm not obviously a huge fan of Cindy Anthony. You know, I don't hate her because I don't know her, but from what I see, I don't, I don't really like her that much, but I feel bad for her when I watch her on the stand. She's clearly distraught. She's lost her granddaughter, who she clearly loves. She's confused on the stand. She's flustered. She doesn't seem to know what to do with her hands, with her self it's just horrible and you can tell in her face in her eyes she's probably been crying non-stop for days so i feel bad for her she's in a really bad position george anthony gets on the stand and he also says this is the first time he's seen or spoken to his daughter in a week and they ask him are you close to your daughter and he says i hope i am george anthony's also asked if casey has ever made an attempt to flee or leave and george says no and then they ask him in your experience as a police officer do you think if we release casey to you in your custody will you be able to make sure she makes it to her trial and he says yes Lee Anthony gets on the stand and he's asked, how close are you to your sister? So they're all basically testifying for her, right? For her to be released on bond. They wanna get her out of jail because they think if she's out of jail, they can talk to her and get more information about where Kaylee is. But they're testifying for her, they're helping her. After everything, they are helping her. I guess in the end, they are helping Kaylee. That's what they think, that's how they justify it. So they all say they have not seen her since the 16th when she was arrested. Lee and Cindy did talk to her very briefly during that phone call that we already talked about. George Anthony has not talked to her. And all three are asked, do you think if you got more time with her one-on-one -on -one alone that she would disclose something to you? that would help you solve this case, and they all say yes. Yuri Melich gets up on the stand and he basically goes over his part in the case and the evidence they found thus far. He testifies that the cadaver dogs did in fact signal that there were human remains in the backyard of the Anthony home, or there had been human remains there at one point. He also brings up the fact that Casey asked to borrow a shovel from her neighbor, which we went over in the first installment of this video. I believe that they were trying to bring this up so they could deter Casey from going out on bond, maybe suggesting that she had hidden Kaylee's body somewhere on the Anthony property, and if she was allowed to go back there, she'd be able to tamper with, remove, or hide evidence. So the judge gets up, and I like this guy because he's straightforward. Once again, the charges are a felony of the third degree, two misdemeanors, and normally she'd be entitled to a reasonable uh, bond, uh, which would be according to the bond schedule, but... Uh... Again, I have some problems with uh, the fact that uh, her conduct just hasn't changed per se and she hasn't been any help in this, uh, 
investigation, not a bit of useful information has been provided by Ms. Anthony as to the whereabouts of her daughter. I would point out that the uh, truth and Ms. Anthony are strangers. He says, I believe that the truth and Ms. Anthony are strangers. It's like poetic. The truth and Ms. Anthony are strangers. He orders a psychological evaluation to be given to Casey to determine her competence and her state of mind. He goes into pretty good detail about how much of a problem he has with her behavior. And he says he has a problem that her behaviors continue during the investigation, not just beforehand. Like she's continuing to lie during the investigation, which doesn't help her daughter at all. He says he has to set bond because that's the law, but he clearly doesn't feel comfortable with it. So he sets a really high bond, $500,000, half a million dollars bond for Casey Anthony, which nobody that she knows has that much money. Nobody's going to be able to pay that. And he says that if she does get out on bond, she has to wear an electronic monitoring device. So like an ankle bracelet. Because the judge ordered it, Casey Anthony has a psychiatric examination. They talk with her and they administer an MMPI, which is a psychological assessment to determine psychopathology and personality in somebody. It's primarily given to those who are suspected to have mental health or other clinical issues. And in Casey Anthony's case, it was given because the psychologists who talked to her were a little unsettled by her lack of affect, her lack of emotion, basically. The fact that she seemed almost cheerful when they were talking to her. They're typically going to look for disorders on two levels, access one and access two. And access one are your basic and standard mental issues like depression, anxiety, PTSD, eating disorders, the most common mental health issues. Access two disorders are going to be your personality and developmental disorders. One's commonly seen to show up in childhood and stay with a person into adulthood. Some examples of these are BPD, which is bipolar personality disorder, NPD, which is narcissistic personality disorder, and APD, which is antisocial personality disorder. The MMPI came back completely normal, and they deemed she was fit to stand trial. There was nothing about her examination, evaluation, or any of the test results that came back suggesting she was anything but normal. There was no sign of any mental disorders or any mental or emotional issues at all. According to her psychiatrists, she did or said nothing to them that would suggest she was even borderline any of these issues. And I know a lot of people have a hard time believing that, even myself. I remember a Dr. Drew episode where he was talking to one of the psychiatrists or psychologists who had spoken with Casey Anthony and he was flabbergasted. He was like, that can't be true. There has to be something wrong with this girl. And it's because we really don't want to admit that somebody who's normal can compulsively lie like that. That somebody who's normal could have possibly hurt their child. But that was her diagnosis or lack thereof. At the most, they said she just seemed very immature for her age. Now my question is, was Casey Anthony just a slightly immature but otherwise normal young woman? Or does she have us all fooled? Have we not given her enough credit for her intelligence, her ability to manipulate, to lie? Is Casey Anthony the evil genius, the Moriarty of our time? Sorry for the Sherlock Holmes reference. And was she so smart and so devious that she knew how to answer these questions in a way that she would appear to be completely normal? Dr. Drew also mentioned that he thought it was strange that the people who had interviewed her and examined her had initially felt really uncomfortable by the way she was acting, had felt like there was something off about her, but once the results came in that said she was normal, they kind of dismissed their initial reaction. And Dr. Drew thinks that they should have trusted their initial instincts instead of just kind of dismissing them after the test came back. Maybe they should have dug a little deeper. On July 23rd, 2008, Casey's now ex-friend Amy Hazinga says she wants to press charges against Casey for stealing from her. On July 25th, 2008, Jose Baez, most likely shook by how poorly the bond hearing went, he approaches the prosecution and tries to get a deal of immunity for Casey. 
On July 25th, George and Cindy Anthony also visit their daughter Casey in jail for the first time and they're able to sit down and talk to her even though there's glass between them and they have to talk through that jail phone. They get to sit down and speak with her a little bit. She starts off the conversation super cheerful as always like, hey guys, I love you, I miss you. They exchange I love yous, they exchange I miss yous. And then Cindy immediately says something that's always haunted me and still does to this day. She says, Casey, we forgive you for anything that you might have said. And Casey replies, I haven't said anything, don't worry. Hi. Hi, sweetie. You can, we've, been, we've been watching you for so long. You haven't? I love you. I love you too. Hi. <laughs> we've been seeing you sitting down. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was talking with one of the doctors. We, we forgive anything that you've said. Oh, or done. Hold, hold on. Can we turn the volume down? Yeah, can, you can probably hear it. I haven't said anything. Don't worry. What are they talking about? What are they talking about? And considering what happens later in Casey Anthony's trial, the accusations she makes towards her father and family, it does seem a little odd to say something like that and to respond in the way that Casey did. Cindy tells Casey that everyone's looking for Kaylee, that her picture is going to be on the cover of People magazine in a few days. It's going to get her her picture and her name out there and people are looking for her everywhere. And Casey's like, that's good. Casey, you don't realize the whole United States is looking for our Kaylee. I know that mom. Her cover is going to be on People magazine in a few days. Okay. Everybody is looking for her. Oh, good. When Casey does start talking though, Cindy interrupts her and she's like, can you look at me in the eyes? Like raise your head a little bit. I'll play you a clip. It's so weird. And you can tell that Casey's getting frustrated about it because she's trying to talk and her mother's like interrupting her to ask her to lift her head and look her in the eye. No, I didn't get a chance to ask Lee. Um, can you look up a little bit more? Raise your eyes up a little bit. There you I go. So actually now Look straight up so I can look into your eyes, darling. Thank you. I need, you know I need to do that. I gave Lee the password. Please look up, sweetheart. I need to see your eyes. I want to be able to look at you guys, too. I can't look at you and look at the camera. Well, you don't have to look at the camera. Look at me. I'm looking at you. Cindy then starts to question Casey again about Zanny, about Zanny's apartment. Was there a drum set in it? Where was it located? What's the inside look like? Do you have pictures of the inside of the apartment? And as she's getting more questions, Casey's getting more and more aggravated. She's like, I've already told you everything I know. I talk to Jose about it every day and he keeps me updated on what's going on out there and I let him know if anything new comes up, but I don't know anything. I have nothing else to tell you. And she's getting really pissy. Casey, I want to ask you just a couple questions. God. I know the pictures with Kaylee in Zanny's apartment. Is Zanny's apart apartment the ones with the drums? She had a drum set, yes. The one in the picture. I think there are even other pictures. I told Lee to look through everything. Okay. Is that Zanny's apartment? Because I know whose apartment it is. Is it Zanny's apartment? That exact apartment? No, that was Ricardo's apartment. It was set up a lot like Zanny's apartment. Do you think Zanny's acting by herself, or does she have help? I don't know, Mom. I, I haven't been able to talk to anybody. I don't know. She also says something about Jesse, Jesse Grund, her ex-fiance, the man who wanted to adopt Kaylee and marry her. She says, don't trust him, don't talk to him. Which is so weird to me, because Jesse's like the one guy who didn't do anything to anybody. He just wanted to do right by Casey and Kaylee, and she's, it looks like to me that she's trying to throw him under the bus, like don't talk to him. So I wonder if he knows more about what's going on with Kaylee. Maybe Casey told him something and she doesn't want anybody to talk to him and him to tell what she told him. And of course, Cindy replies, always the everlasting fan of Jesse Grund, I've been thinking the same thing. Cindy, you're a very bad judge of character. Okay, you need to not talk or judge anybody ever. Now George Anthony gets on the phone and he's like, I wish I'd been a better father to you. I wish I'd been a better grandfather to Kaylee. And Casey's like, don't ever say that. You've been a great grandfather to Kaylee. I'm so glad that she had you guys as grandparents. You know, you couldn't have been better. Which once again, considering the accusations she makes against him later, is an odd thing to say. I want you to know, I want to take your pain away from you. So you, know, you can tell me anything. I know that, Dad. I miss you, sweetie. I know that. I miss you.
missed you too. I wish I could have been a better dad and better grandpa, you know? You've been a great dad and you've been the best grandfather. Don't for a second think otherwise. Well, you know, you, you and mom have been the best grandparents. Kaylee's been so lucky. Kaylee okay, is well. so lucky to have both of you. You. I can't even put into words how glad I am that she's had both of you and that she still has both of you. She does not have Kaylee's best interests at heart at this point. She's not concerned about finding her daughter because if she was, she wouldn't be feeding everybody false information, leading them in all crazy directions instead of actually looking for her daughter. This suggests to me that she knows where her daughter is and she doesn't want her daughter to be found. Just my opinion and everybody else's in the world. On July 29th, the state prosecutor Linda Burdick offers Jose Baez limited use immunity for his client if she's willing to help them locate Kaylee. Now, limited use immunity is a legal term. It's used to describe a deal that can be given to somebody who's being charged with a crime. Limited immunity is granted to this person, but it's a slippery slope. It essentially means that the defendant's statements cannot be used directly against them, but the statements can be used indirectly against them. Those statements can be used to obtain other leads, to cross-examine if you ever choose to go on the stand in defense of yourself, or to really pretty much just catch you up at any time if you're lying. So basically, I feel like this is off the table for Casey Anthony since she seems incapable of opening her mouth without ever lying. At this time, Cindy and George Anthony are experiencing a great deal of harassment from the community. They've already decided that Casey's guilty and her parents are guilty by association. There's a lot of people searching for Kaylee Anthony, a lot of people who are emotionally invested in finding her, a lot of people who are interested in obtaining the $250,000 reward that is put out for any information that leads to her being found. But Cindy Anthony didn't think the police were prioritizing the search for Kaylee. She thought they were more interested in going after Casey. So she reached out to a Texas-based company called EquuSearch, and I think that's how it's pronounced because it's spelled very strangely. It's spelled E-Q-U-U search, EquuSearch. But this is a company that basically provides volunteers for search and rescue missions, and they do so without charging the people they're helping. It seems like this company brought a great deal of trained individuals and spent a lot of money in the search for Kaylee Anthony. The police also depended a great deal on EqualSearch's results at this time, so if EqualSearch said that they had thoroughly checked an area, the police would spend less attention on that area or possibly not even look at all. So everyone's out looking for Kaylee. With good intentions or selfish intentions, it doesn't really matter because in this kind of case, the more the merrier. And as this is happening, Casey's in jail, the investigation's going on, and because of the Sunshine Law in Florida, which is basically a law that I would love to have access to, but it's a law that says any public information like going on with trials or things like that or government agencies are made public to everybody in Florida. So you can just get that information. So everyone knew what was happening in Casey Anthony's case. They knew what kind of evidence had been found, what she was saying in interviews, what the police thought was going on. They knew everything, which can be problematic because now it's really hard to find a jury poll that hasn't already had access to evidence and kind of examined it and come to their own conclusions, this would be a dream for me to just have access to everything I wanted from a case. It would be amazing. But because of this law, we basically have the citizens of Florida turning into a mob of angry people who show up at the Anthony home with signs and shouting baby killer and harassing Cindy and George every time they leave or come into their home. Both George and Cindy engage with these people on multiple occasions and not in the best way. And it doesn't really do much for their image as sane people. It makes them look crazy. Now, to be honest, I can't tell you that I would have done much better. I would have probably lost my mind. Sometimes if I get a really negative, mean comment, I just wanna snap back so hard here on YouTube. So I can't imagine if somebody was standing in my face screaming those things, how I would react. I definitely for sure would snap, so I can't judge them for this at all. But it didn't help how they appeared to the media and to the public. So on August 11th, a meter reader named Roy Kronk was working in the area of the Anthony home, and he went into some wooded area, like the woods, by the Anthony's neighborhood because he had to relieve himself. And as he's standing there doing that, he sees something that he thinks looks like a skull. But as he's kind of looking at it, he and his friends get distracted by a rattlesnake. 
men. <laughs> they get distracted by this rattlesnake, they grab it and they bring it back to work to scare their coworkers. But later he tells his girlfriend what he thinks he saw and she urges him to call the police. So he makes a 911 call on August 12th and I will play that for you. Hi, I don't have it. I always, I don't always, I called the non-emergency line. Somehow How I can I help you, sir? Uh, I'm a meter reader with Orange County, and I had the route today that included the Anthony's home. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I went down to the school and came back, and when I was coming back, I stopped between the two swamp areas there. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not. No, but go ahead. But there's a stretch of road there that goes from, like, the, where the start of their road is down to a school, and, and in between it, on either side, there's a swamp. And if you're heading back out towards the main road uh, on the left-hand side in an area, I noticed something that looked white and there was a, uh, like a gray bag down in there. I don't know what it is. I'm not telling you it's, you know, it's Kaylee or anything of that okay. nature. But yep. I just thought, huh? A deputy goes over to the area that was indicated by Roy and he kind of drives by and says he looks, but he says he didn't see anything. The next day, August 13th, Roy Cronk calls again. Sheriff's Office. Yeah, hi, my name is Roy Conk. I'm a meter reader with Orange County. Yesterday, I read the Anthony's route. Uh, uh, we got done, and I got done, and I went down. Do you know where the school is down there at the bottom of the suburban? Mm -hmm. I called this in yesterday. I don't know if this is what you all looked at today or not, but uh, on the way back up, I stopped uh, in the middle there where there's a swamp. There's a, if you're coming out, there would be a fence on the right-hand side and just open you know, swamp area on the left-hand side. I went down, uh, well, I had to take it, you know, I went down, and there behind one of the trees was a gray vinyl-like bag, like a pool cover or something like that, and it looked rather suspicious. I didn't touch anything, and then a little bit further up, you can tell where someone ran across with a mower, but the weeds are still real high in that area. There's a fallen tree that looks someone had tried to cut on it at one point, but there was a white board hanging across the tree, and there was something round and white underneath of it. And uh, I don't know what it is, but it just didn't look like something that should be there. According to police reports after the 911 call, they said that that area had already been checked and searched by search parties looking for Kaylee. But they sent another deputy over who claims he went by and looked around and didn't see anything. He calls again on August 13th and he says, listen, you guys told me to meet you here because at one point he was like, why aren't you like finding what I'm seeing? And so they said, well, why don't you meet us there so you can point out what you see? So he was waiting there and he's like calling 911 saying, I'm waiting here and people are supposed to be coming here to meet me and nobody's here yet and they're like, don't worry, they're on their way. So two officers show up and one of them kind of goes into the brush where Roy's pointing and slips because it's really wet and it's kind of treacherous in this area and he slips and kind of falls down a hill a little bit and then he's like, I'm out, I'm not even looking in here. There's nothing in here. This is a place where people throw garbage. You probably just saw garbage. You're wasting the police's time. So Roy's obviously offended at this point. He's called three times. He's tried to make an effort to make this known to the police department and they basically treated him poorly in his opinion. So he kind of gives up and he doesn't pursue it any further at this time. On August 14th, Casey's parents visit her in jail again. And as with the first conversation that they've had in jail, she starts off this one very cheerfully. But Cindy's not cheerful. Cindy's crying from the moment Casey sits down and Casey's kind of annoyed by this, I would say. And she looks at her dad and she's like, why is she crying already? I don't know, because her granddaughter's missing. Nobody knows where she is. It's her birthday month, like her birthday's right around the corner. She's upset. Why aren't you crying? Good morning. Good morning, beautiful. I love you. Hi. I love you, too. Why is she crying already? <laughs> because we haven't seen you. I know. Hey, hold on one second. They ask her again if she knows anything else, anything she can remember. Anything will help. And she gets frustrated. She's like, I've been in here for a month. I'm out of the loop. I don't even know what's going on out there. I have nothing new to give you. I'm so sick of this. You guys don't know how hard this has been on me in here. I'm in here and it's horrible. And I know you guys want to find Kaylee. That's your first priority, but this is hard for me. And Cindy's talking to her and Casey's like, can I just talk to dad basically? You know, he's the one I wanted to see. Like I want to see everybody, but dad's really the one I wanted to talk to. So can I just talk to dad? Which once again is weird considering the things she accuses him of later. So George Anthony gets on the phone and then it just gets super 
strange. And he says, listen, Casey, you're the boss right now. You're in charge. And she's like, no, I'm not anymore, dad. And he says, imagine you own a big corporation. You're the boss and Jose's one of your employees and me and mom, we're your employees and you're in control and you're running the show. Yeah, I wanted to see dad. I mean, I want to see everybody, but I had to choose and I wanted to see dad. All right, well then here, talk to your dad. Hey, sweetheart. Hey. Hey, listen, I want you to know, you are the boss through this whole thing, okay? Well, no, I'm not anymore, Dad. I haven't been since I got oh, here. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you are. You you, you are the... Th think of this for a second. <laughs> Dad, you, you, I've been... Listen, listen. Okay, okay, listen, no, I've no, been just thinking listen to me just for this. one moment. Okay, just listen to me for one second, okay? Listen, think of you, uh, you owning this conglomerate, this huge business. Jose is one of your employees, so is the sheriff's department, so is the FBI, so am I, so is Lee, so is mom. You know, we're, we're all working with you. You're the one that can say, listen. I've please, told please. Jose, no, I've given him the information to give you guys. We've given the information. You guys have given everything to the police. They're not helping us. It's obvious. We know their intentions. So, I'm sorry. I've helped in every way that I possibly can since the day I got here. Okay, they well, didn't even give me 24 hours to help them, the police, without putting me here. What is going on? They seem so deferential to her. Like she runs shit at the Anthony home. You're the boss. You're in control. I'm going to play you a clip so you can see it for yourself. Okay, so yeah, that's really weird, right? Really weird. I'm not off base. So enter Leonard Padilla. Leonard Padilla is a bounty hunter. Yes, a real life bounty hunter. He wears a cowboy hat and he's from California where he has a bounty hunter office, I guess. You cannot make this shit up, people, and it gets crazier. So he flies from Sacramento, California to Florida and he pays Casey's bond. Now this may seem weird, but it's actually selfish because, you know, a bounty hunter, he's worried about money. So he actually pays Casey's bond because he only has to pay $50,000. That's how much you have to pay. I think it's like 5% of the actual bond is how much you have to pay for that person to be out on bond, but you don't get that money back if they're found to be guilty. He pays the $50,000 bond because he thinks that Kaylee's still alive and he thinks Casey knows more than she's telling. And he thinks if he can get her alone and out of jail, he can get this information from her. He can then find Kaylee from the nanny or whoever took her and he can now get the $250,000 reward. So you have to understand he's thinking he's putting down 50,000, but he's going to get 250 back. So he's making a $200,000 profit. On August 20th, Leonard Padilla had a secret meeting at a nearby IHOP with Casey's defense team and the bondsmen and all that stuff. <laughs> When Casey was released, she was brought to her parents' home that night. And Leonard Padilla tells a really strange story that that night he was at the Anthony's home with Casey and a pizza was delivered. So the family ate the pizza and then another pizza was delivered and they ate that one too. And Leonard asked Lee Anthony, like who's buying these pizzas? Who's ordering these pizzas? And Lee Anthony was like, I am, I am ordering them. I paid for them. So Leonard's like, okay, but then the third pizza comes and the fourth pizza and Leonard Padilla is like, something's off here. This, why are they ordering so many pizzas? There's four people here. And so he finally gets the family to confess that they actually don't know where these pizzas are coming from and somebody's just sending them. And he's like, do you people think this is a game? Are you crazy? Somebody could have laced these pizzas with cyanide and sent them to you and you guys are just gobbling them up. Even though, according to Jose Baez, he was not supposed to talk with Casey about the case. Of course, he's there to find Keely and get the money. So he does. And he claims Casey told him a completely different story than she told the police. Casey told him that the day that Keely went missing, she actually was in a park or a playground with Zenaida and Zenaida's sister, and they held her down and said they were taking Kaylee because of money that Casey owed them. And they gave her a list of things to tell the police so that they wouldn't get caught. And Leonard looks at her like, is she for real? And he literally says to her, I didn't come 3,000 miles and leave my chihuahua to listen to this shit. He has a chihuahua. <laughs> you cannot make this up. Casey then told Leonard Padilla, if you're gonna to talk to me like a cop, you can leave my house. And then she never spoke to him again. 
Casey also spoke a little bit to Padilla's head of security and fellow bounty hunter, Rob Dick. So yes, Padilla travels with a security detail. So she talks to Rob Dick and told him she didn't realize that she was gonna become a celebrity and maybe she should start taking pictures of herself and autograph them and sell them for money and she could become rich. It didn't really matter at this point that her bond was paid though, because within a week, the police would arrest her again on check cashing fraud, which was because of Amy pressing charges. And then Jose Baez gets up and says this whole dramatic statement that the police have been planning this for a while. They knew they were gonna do this. They just wanted to let her go out on bond so that they could publicly arrest her again in front of the media, which may be so, but who cares? Who cares? That's not really the point here. She's guilty for something and she's being arrested for it. There's really no chance now of Casey getting out of jail or prison until her trial's done. So as Casey's in jail, another plot twist. The actual Zenaida Gonzalez Fernandez files a lawsuit against Casey Anthony for defamation because since Casey entered Zenaida's name into the mix in connection with her missing child, she's basically had everybody thinking she's like a kidnapper and it's been rough on her. So she's suing Casey for defamation. On October 14th, 19 people in a Florida grand jury hand down a seven count indictment for Casey Anthony, including murder, child neglect, and lying to the police. Keep in mind when this indictment is handed down, there's no proof that Kaylee Anthony is even gone. There's no proof she's dead. They haven't found a body. They haven't found any evidence or connection that Kaylee might not be alive any longer, but they still felt that there was enough evidence to put Casey on trial for her death. Casey is then taken back into custody and re-arrested on these seven charges. And this is where we're gonna end the video today. And the next one will be out in a couple of days. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. I hope you really got a lot of information out of it. I can't wait to record and share with you the final piece of this puzzle. If you have any comments, please leave them. But once again, no spoilers. A lot of people didn't listen to me in the first video when I said no spoilers. There was a lot of people who were coming to Casey's defense. Not a lot of people, like two people were coming to Casey's defense and giving all this like evidence that we were gonna talk about in the trial portion of the series. And I'm just like, do you have to? Could you could you just wait until the whole video is out? Like until every part is out? Would you be in the middle of a movie, in a movie theater and just be like, listen guys, this isn't the way it goes and this is false and I'm judging this movie already. So that agitated me, but 99.9% .9 of you are amazing and I love you all so very much. I hope you're having a great 2019 so far and I will see you very soon. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Bye guys. As on the road, look on.